Uh, as I mentioned yesterday at the very start, Professor Vittorio Santoro uh, has been decisive in uh, the creation of the framework within the law school of the University of Siena, which uh, made this project possible. He was the one who had the idea, he was the one who acted as a federator of uh, uh, different disciplines and people uh, and uh, uh, who actually initiated the, the, the process in all possible respects. I'm very grateful to him uh, for this role he had and then uh, all along the um, development of the project uh, is being, of course, of uh, constant inspiration in addition to uh, organizing himself uh, the event which uh, took place in Rome at Bank of Italy and concerned this very specific topic. So very uh, happy to give him the floor for uh, chairing this session. Thank you, Marco, and uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, first of all, welcome again to all of you. Uh, and uh, in uh, second uh, uh, place, I want to uh, give you some information. The first one uh, is that this event is uh, recorded. And the second one is it is necessary that uh, uh, the microphone uh, need to be switched off. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, with, with that, uh, of, of course, this is not valid for the speaker. Let me give a, a, a warm welcome to uh, a lot of uh, friends of mine. Uh, Professor Vicent Ribas, Professora uh, Adoracion Perez, and Professora Marta Bozina, as well uh, Cecilia Cardarelli. Uh, I, I think uh, each speaker can have uh, 30, 35 minutes about. Um, I, I let me uh, have a, a very short introduction. This afternoon session is connected to the symposium that was held in Rome at the Bank of Italy on 44-45 October 2018 and concerning the harmonization and the regulation of a financial market to prevent money laundering and terrorism financing. During that meeting, the perspective was to analyze according to which national, national and EU laws deal with the monitoring and the cash flow and economics activity as a key sectors to develop an effective way to combat criminal and terrorist organizations operating in their territory. Indeed, it was paid particular attention both to the phenomena that underlie the use of capital to conceal the illegal nature of a flow of funds and to the phenomena where wealth is directed to illegal businesses to support them. In fact, the primary goal of organized crime is profit. Law enforcement must therefore have the capacity to turn the spotlight on the finan finance and organized crime, often inherently linked to corruption, fraud, counterfeiting, and smuggling. International criminal networks use illegal business to structures to conceal the source of their profits. So action is needed to address the infiltration of the illicit economy by organized crime. This afternoon, we'll, we will pay attention to developments in the financial system and payments. The link with the Rome Symposium is direct with the presentation of Marta Bozina as the question about the virtual currency concerns 
anonymity and anti-money laundering. As well, there are links with all the afternoon presentation. Let me introduce you the four speakers uh, of this section. Uh, two of these, uh, Vincent Ribas and uh, Adoration Perez, are professor in the Università uh, di Alcalá di Henares. Um, Marta Bosina is professor uh, uh, in the Università of Pula, Croatia. And uh, maybe you know well uh, Maria Cecilia Cardarelli, uh, who is professor in the Università uh, of Lecce. Um, the first speaker of the afternoon is uh, Adoration Perez. Uh, the, the speech is about new fin financial services and the regulatory sandbox in Europe, challenges and risks. Adoration, the floor is yours, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your invitation uh, to this conference. Uh, I thank the organizers, uh, in particular uh, to Professor uh, uh, Santoro, for holding the academic links with the University of Alcalá in Spain which allow us uh, periodical encounters in Spain and in Italy. Of course, uh, we, we, would, we would prefer to see you all uh, in person in Siena, as it was planned from the beginning, uh, but also we are, glad, uh, we are glad in some way relief of having this video conference. It has been a, a very difficult time in all the countries, uh, but particularly in Italy and Spain. And in, in this situation, having a conference about boosting European security law and policy and the project be behind, coordinated by Professor Ventura, uh, seems even more relevant than before the pandemic. Well, as the program shows and Professor Santoro pointed out, uh, boosting European security law and policy have many perspectives and an important one is related with financial flows and movement of capitals, the subject being discussed in this session. My presentation focuses in new financial services and regulatory sandboxes in Europe, challenges and risks. Uh, I, I am going to divide me, my presentation uh, in seven points and I have prepared uh, a presentation uh, with, which I am trying to uh, share with you. Just one second. Compartir, no. Sorry, just one second. Okay. I am I am going to share, I think I am going to manage. Uh, Yes, I think, could you see the presentation? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, so, okay. thank you. So, I am going to uh, divide my presentation in seven points. One is about the, the first one, the concept of regulatory sandboxes. The second one is uh, about the existing regulatory sandboxes in Europe. The third point is uh, the common features of regulatory sandboxes. The fourth, the functioning 
and the phases of the regulatory sandboxes, five pros and cons, and six common approach toward regulatory sandboxes in Europea, in the European Union with question mark we, because we are going to see uh, uh, how it is about and uh, finally a conclusion. Well, beginning with uh, the first the first point the concept the concept of regulatory sandboxes. This concept are related to the call fintech fintech financial services that comprise new financial products or business resulting from the application of digital technologies thus related for instance with blockchain or distrib distributed layer technologies big data analytics bitcoins or cryptocurrencies electronic payments, crowdfunding and crowd lending, robo advisors, machine learnings and so on. More precisely, FinTech is defined in different European reports as technologically enabled financial innovations that could result in new business models, applications, processes or products with an associated material effect on financial markets and institutions and the provisions of financial services. Some of these new financial innovations has been regulated in some states. It's the case, for instance, of crowdfunding, pending as well of a draft regulation at a European level. And some issues related with payments, open banking, discussed later as well. But being so wide, so wide the range of the digital technologies applicable to financial services and due the fast development of new innovations, apart from regulating authorities from different states in the world and in the European Union, have adopted different initiatives with the view to facilitate financial innovation and at the same time having the providers under certain supervisory control. In this field, play its role the so-called regulatory sandboxes, a kind of initiative designed to promote greater in engagement between competent authorities and firms in order to increase the knowledge of competent authorities about innovations and the opportunities and risks they present and also on the other hand to improve firms understanding of regulatory and supervisory expectations so uh, what are uh, sandboxes? What are sandboxes? Regulatory sandboxes are schemes or programs which enable, enable firms to test innovative financial products, financial services or business models through a specific testing plan agreed and monitored by a supervisory authority. The name, of course, is metaphoric. It's like a pre, it's like a playground in which to experiment and play in precisely perimeter without having to face the rules of the real world. So is the metaphor. Mm, regulatory uh, sandboxes are a relative, relative new phenomenon. For the first time, were established in the United Kingdom in May 2016 by the Financial Conduct Authority. In the European Union, the next member state establishing another was the Netherlands in January of uh, 2017 by the Netherlands Bank in a joint initiative with the Autorité Financière Market. Later, Denmark in October 
of uh, 2017 by the Danish Financial Supervisory Authority and following Li Lithuania and Poland uh, in uh, 2018. There are more examples and other states are preparing to set up their own regulatory sandboxes. It's the case, for instance, of Italy with a draft under pu public consultation until the 19th of March of this year. So I suppose it has been paralyzed by the pandemic. In this draft, the sandbox, the sandbox is called Experimentazione Fintech. It's, it's another, it's another uh, way, yeah, it's a translation, uh, but also pointing out the idea of experimentazione. In Spain, it's going to be regula regulated also a sandbox under the name of Espacio Controlado de Pruebas, that is Safe Space for Testing. A draft law was approved at the end of the February this year by the government and now is in discussion in the parliament uh, with the delay due also to the pandemic. Uh, so, mm, what are the common features of regulatory sandboxes? Limited experience has been acquired in the in the functioning of some boxes, but however, some observations can be made under a comparative analysis. Basic and most common features of some boxes are uh, some of them are uh, here. First of one, a some boxes are cross sectorial. That means not limited to a specific part of the financial sector. So, it can be tested in some boxes, products related to, to banking, investment activities and services, and insurance. The first program in the UK in 2017 involved uh, 18 firms, in including payment institutions and electronic money institutions, and a wide range of innovations, including online platforms for consumers to manage financial products or software platforms to streamline initial public coin offerings. Well, in second, uh, in second place, we can also point it out that some boxes uh, do not allow the carrying, the carrying out of regulated fi financial services without a, li a license. This is a very important point. That means that some boxes do not provide a space for regulation exemptions or ordinary supervisor, supervision. Rather, all the normal supervisory powers, procedures and tools apply. So, if an applicant found to be eligible to participate in a regulatory sandbox and wishes to test a tool that would involve the carrying out of a regulated activity and the firm does not already hold the relevant license, the license is required to be acquired as a part of the preparation phase for entering the sandbox. The type of license required is determined by reference to the regulated activity or, or activities to be carried. For instance, credit institutions, investment firm, or insurance undertaking. And as a third point, see, we can also point it out that sandboxes are open to firms that are already present in the market, new entrants and other fir firms, for instance, technologically, technology providers partnering with financial institutions. The mm, sandboxes provide a specific entry conditions for applicants to participate in the sandbox and among them 
require demonstration of a genuine innovation in order to be eligible for participation in the sandbox. If the firm does not satisfy the relevant requirements, the firm will not be admitted to the test. E or next common feature. If a firm is admitted to test, then testing parameters will, will be specified by the competent authority. These testing parameters are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And finally, some boxes provide for a controlled exit from the sandbox with either the continuation or the discontinuation of the proposition. Mm, we can also understand better mm, or a little bit more how uh, function the regulatory sandboxes consider, considering the different phases. Mm, they mm, divide in fourth Phases. Typically, regulatory sandboxes involve several phase phases. This can be briefly described as an application phase, a preparation phase, a testing phase, and an exit or evaluation phase, according to which the activities will be continued, continued or not. Well, regarding to the application phase, in some states like Lithuania, Netherlands and Poland, firms may submit an application to participate in the regulatory sandbox at any time. In others, like for, like for instance United Kingdom, the competent authorities have run court call for proposal under which applicants are able to apply for testing during the designated periods. The application window is typically open for a period of up to two months and applicants are able to apply for testing in the regulatory sandbox by completing and submitting a standardized application form. Applications are judged by the competent authorities with uh, public available criteria. Only propositions that meet the criteria will be accepted for testing. The, criteri the, cri the criteria usually refer, among other, to the following. If uh, the proposition involves a regulated financial service or could support the provision of regulated financial services in the market, the innovative of the propositions, the proposition or the customer benefits. Also, the need for testing in the regulatory sandbox, usually the proposition does not fit easily into the existing regulatory framework framework. There is no alternative means of engaging, engaging with the competent authority or achieving the testing objective in a life environment. Or the readiness of the firm to test the proposition. For instance, has the firm developed a business plan and a suitable governance program, operational and other risk control provisions that would be some uh, criteria considered in the applications. During the preparation phase, the competent authorities work with the firms deemed eligible to participate in the regulatory sandboxes to, determ to determine, for instance, whether or not the, prop the proposition to be tested involves a regula regulated activity. Uh, and well, after this preparation uh, phase, uh, which is, is very important, uh, can, uh, the, the third phase is the testing phase, the testing phase where the firms test their products in this playground, which is the sandbox. The periods of the testing uh, phase 
uh, depends on the, the states, but I think, for instance, in the project, the Italian project, it would be for 18 months. And the, the latest uh, phase is the evaluation or exit from the sandbox. And as I said, the authorities could say here, if they can continue with the activity or uh, they constrain so, to some, some limitations. Uh, well, in brief, this is uh, uh, how a regulatory sandbox uh, functions. According to what we have seen, uh, which are the pros and cons uh, we can see to this kind of mm, regulatory sandboxes? Well, uh, there are much uh, food for thought here and we, can, we could discuss uh, this uh, deeply, uh, but I am going to try brief. As a pros or advantages, we can we can point it out that sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes, uh, increase the knowledge of the authorities about financial innovations. They can uh, know better the risks and the opportunities provided, for instance, regarding, regarding consumer protection or also financial stability. And the lessons learned by the authorities can inform the appropriate regulatory and supervisory response and to inform the approach to the regulation and supervision of financial innovations uh, through this direct testing. That is, we can see the benefit for authorities and also we can also say for public uh, interest. Uh, on the other hand, we can also point out as an uh, advantage or, or pros that enhance firms' understanding of regulatory framework. M uh, many of these innovative uh, products uh, are like uh, in a border and uh, uh, many uh, firms, particularly startups, uh, at the beginning, they don't understand uh, so well the regulatory framework they, they could be subject in the future. And third, uh, it is agreed that uh, regulatory sandboxes uh, foster innovation because they, they are uh, like a, a call, call for proposals for uh, innovation uh, innovations uh, with application to the financial sectors so they foster or promote mm, innovation which which is, is a great aim uh, inside the U european union Mm, but uh, which are the cons, the disadvantages, the perils of the sandboxes? Uh, here uh, we can also uh, speak about many, but I am going to point out uh, some. Mm, of, of course, pre they present difficulties uh, for, for the authorities. Uh, in finding and retaining staff with the appropriate knowledge. Uh, and we can also say briefly, a good sandbox uh, would be very expensive from this point of view. And for instance, in the draft, the Spanish draft, any new staff is uh, going uh, to contract to uh, to make functioning the sandbox. So uh, here we can we can have uh, one problem. Also, uh, we can observe that uh, the coordination of, uh, between authorities from the different sectors, financial sectors, uh, must be uh, necessary, and so sometimes. Uh, difficulties arise and also uh, these uh, financial innovations often involve uh, issues beyond direct sphere 
a sphere of responsibility of these authorities. For instance, data protection or uh, laundry money or other uh, uh, questions which are not uh, directly under the sphere of these authorities. And moreover, if we think in a, uh, that we are talking about uh, the European Union, uh, the need of cross-border cooperation between uh, the different author national authorities uh, are of course uh, or could be also problematic and uh, for the first point that this is a need. Also uh, in the third point and I think this third point is very important as uh, you can see we are uh, we are seeing that uh, regulatory sandboxes in, in Europe uh, are being uh, created as a national level, not at European level. Uh, every state uh, could have uh, her, their own uh, regulatory sandboxes. So different approaches could affect the attractiveness of jurisdictions as center for financial innovation. And these different approaches also uh, could arise uh, some important questions uh, in, inside of Europe, like forum shopping and regulatory arbitrage uh, problems undermining the level playing field. Mm. Fourth, and also I think is um, a very important point, services tested may be perceived by consumers as endorsed by the competent authority. And this is connected with the next uh, con or potentially problem, that is that pro potential uh, films that are inside of sandboxes uh, has a potential preferential access to financing at all preferential market positioning in the private sector. So, uh, surveys uh, among many startups or uh, other kind of firms uh, see these um, regulatory sandboxes as a, a way, a first way uh, for later to uh, win uh, financing for uh, their innovations. And uh, well, mm, uh, at the end, also uh, some legal risk uh, can, can also uh, affect to the competent authorities if, as a result of the application of these services, uh, um, bad consequences uh, uh, will be uh, done. So. Uh, which are the approach uh, in the European Union? Well, uh, now I am I'm, I am going into my my personal uh, view. Uh, briefly, I would say is is very weak for the moment because uh, sandboxes uh, are um, contemplated in the financial action pl plan of the European Commission but with the view only to create uh, best practice, practices and encourage, and encourage them, but uh, at, a, at, a, at a national uh, level. Mm. Uh, and encouraging these best practices, uh, the European supervisory authorities, uh, they have published uh, last year a report uh, giving some principle, principles for establishing an operation of innovation facilitators, particularly sandboxes, but these principles uh, well, are more or less what I, am, I have explained here, so are very general uh, and are uh, like a, a weak common approach. And well, uh, conclu concluding, we because I'm not going to, I'm the first, but uh, uh, the other speakers, 
are waiting for the, the uh, place. Yes. Well, in my conclusion, this sandy, uh, we are in a sandy territories mm, in plural uh, because uh, we, ca we could have uh, many regulatory sandboxes, so many as uh, member states, uh, and mm, it would need, in my opinion, if we, we would like to foster innovation at the European level, like a, a kind of approach more stark in order to, uh, to have uh, more harmonization or even uh, a direct control or one entity in, uh, in Europe. And that is, uh, well, my presentation, I hope. Uh, I, I am, I am, thank you very much. I am open to your questions and I hope the communication uh, would be fine. And and I, I, and I give the, the, the floor to Professor Santoro. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Vittorio Santoro, I think your micro is closed. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, I repeat, uh, thank you for uh, your interesting uh, overview on sandbox system. Uh, I think many questions are, uh, of, of course, uh, uh, open. Uh, I have a, 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 little, a little question uh, on your uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, if uh, you think uh, that the sandbox system is really efficient. Uh, you say, uh, on the other hand, that the system is uh, expensive, if I understand well. I, I want, uh, at this regard, uh, uh, to tell about uh, uh, an example for what concerns uh, Italy with uh, regard to testing sandbox for digital tokens. Uh, in the Italian case, the initial coin offerings, offerings sorry, of tokens has had some success for the financial of small and medium-sized enterprises. But uh, as soon as the CONSOB, this uh, CONSOB is uh, the Italian authority, has uh, announced that it wants uh, uh, to test the emission those emissions have drastically reduced. And uh, I, I think, therefore, that uh, uh, the market not want uh, any kind uh, of supervision. Um, well, have you an opinion about, uh, about that? Mm, well, uh, mm, I, I think that uh, we have little experience uh, with regulatory sandboxes, yes, because the first one in the world, it was this in the United Kingdom. So we have uh, four years experience maximum, and um, as far as I know, uh, nearly 1,000 firms have been subject to the regulatory sandbox uh, in London, in the United Kingdom. Uh, I think for the United Kingdom, uh, as, a, as a country, yes, this, this kind of sandbox has, uh, has acted as uh, to attract many firms to uh, their jurisdiction. Uh, and I think, of course, for every country, uh, this is good. And uh, as far as I know also, the, the sandbox of the United Kingdom uh, is well prepared with, uh, with the, the authorities, uh, have uh, staff uh, speci special, specialized uh, to to, to speak and to, to dialogue with the firms, yes. They, they have to know uh, 
better than the firms, the new, the new uh, financial products, the, the new technologies, because in other case, the idea of regulatory sandboxes would be you no know, useful. Yes. Okay. What happened in other countries? For instance, in Spain, uh, the Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores and uh, the, the supervisors, yes, the staff, the staff are mainly lawyers and economics, uh, and this kind of staff, uh, as we are, no, people from the law, yes, I think uh, uh, we are uh, staff well prepared. For the, for the traditional supervisory system. But for the new, this new, this kind of new supervisory system, like this uh, sandboxing, uh, I think is not prepared, yes? And one mistake or uh, disadvantage which, which I see in the draft law of the Spanish sandbox is that uh, specifically uh, state that any new staff will be contracted uh, to run this sandbox. So, uh, so uh, uh, answering your question, I don't know if I answer your yes, question. Yes, yes, I understand. Thank you. Uh, I agree, but I, su I suppose that uh, non all the market uh, are efficient. Um, uh, on my knowledge, uh, um, some many Italian teams uh, in the market of the ICOS prefer uh, foreign jurisdiction, uh, the US jurisdiction or the UK jurisdiction, and not prefer uh, at the moment uh, the Italian one. Uh, this is uh, uh, maybe the exact uh, answer. Okay. Uh, I, I suppose we can uh, have uh, uh, the, a final discussion on this topic uh, as well as the other. And, and now we have uh, the second uh, speech, uh, Professor, the speech of Professor Ribas. At, uh, the speech was about the payment institution prudential framework in open banking services. The floor is yours, Vincent, please. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Vittorio Santoro. Let me thank also to the scientific committee, Marco Ventura, Alessandro Palmieri, Ricardo Pavoni, many thanks for the assistance for Isabella Massé, Gian Maria Milani. My paper is about payment institutions production framework when operating open banking system. Um, let me let me show. Let me show. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think. Um, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Let me show the presentation. Maybe it can be helpful for for us if if we can do it. So. My paper is about, as I, as I told you, uh, payment institutions. I think this is uh, something related with, um, I would say, a new economy, new banks, uh, recent examples, for example. This week, Facebook launched, um, has, has launched its digital payment services in Brazil. And uh, as you know, um, WhatsApp, WhatsApp Pay allows users to send money to one to another for free or make purchases from a small businesses. Uh, probably you know that in January, Chief Executive Mark Zuckerberg aligned plans to offer the services in India, Indonesia, and Mexico. 
So maybe speaking from the from the present, but also from the future, can be um, interesting to uh, analyze and reflect about these questions. Uh, my paper uh, or my subject has three aspects. First, the payment institutions, the actors. Second, the open banking services, the services, of course. And third, the prudential framework of the payment institutions operating open banking services. This is the structure presented below. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the explanation of three parts is convenient in the understanding of the nature and complexity of the system. The concept of open banking is, I would say, re relatively recent and open banking services as part of a broader innovative ecosystem driven by payment institutions. And in this context, we find new actors and new services created mainly from the market and new technologies. So firstly, I would like to um, refer to the set of payment institutions, which allows us to distinguish them from a typical traditional financial institutions. Secondly, we analyze payment services in general to distinguish them from payment services in particular. And finally, we take into consideration the prudential framework of the institutions that uniquely operate open banking systems. Maybe for those who are not familiar in this environment, it is possible that the novel structuring and denomination could create some confusion, confusion but I, I, I'll do my best. So, first of all, um, about the regulatory framework, I, I would like to consider two approaches. Uh, the first one is a bottom-up approach. It's based on cashless and mobile economy. Countries such as the United States, China, and Singapore follow this path. The second can be called the top down approach guided by regulatory changes. Europe fits better in this one. What means that new markets have mostly been driven by regulatory changes. Our work is fundamentally based on recent European evolution. Its main pillar pillars are the I two directives on payment services from 2007 and 2015, the first one, no longer in force, is the so-called first directive on, pay on payment services, PSD1. The second, currently in force, is known as the PSD2 or second payment service directive. These directives establish the general regulation or regulatory framework that facilitates the development of financial services in open banking. Just to uh, time frame the evolution for implementation, just three, uh, th 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 three little things for our context. The PSD2 entered into force the 13th January 2018. And, uh, on the 14th of March in, in 2019, sent certain rules entered in, into force for um, account servicing payment service providers. And um, on the other hand, technical standards for a strong customer authentication and other standards entered into force um, well, where to enter into force on the 14th September 2019. But considering the complexity of the payment markets across the EU, the challenges arising for the changes that were required, and um, particular for actors that were not 
payment service providers such, such as e-merchants, the EBA considered that the national competent authorities could provide limited additional time for e-commerce, mainly card-based payment transactions, in order to migrate to authentication approaches. But at the end, um, the, the ABA has come to the conclusion that the supervisory flexibility should end or should be completed by the 31st December 2020. So let me repeat, we are in the prison, in the future, an ongoing, um, an ongoing uh, market. Um, what is open banking? Broadly speaking, open banking is the secure way to give providers access to your financial information. PSD1 and 2 does not define open banking. So, for example, you can find this definition on the website of the Open Banking Information Entity, which is the delivery organization working with other stakeholders to define and develop the required applications, security and other standards to underpin open banking in the United Kingdom. So giving providers access to your financial information, sharing it with third parties other than your bank, allowing them access to your financial data is a starting point. The open banking ecosystem is aimed at increasing innovation and competition in order to benefit the consumer. And throughout a complex system of specialized applications and websites, clients may improve the understanding of their accounts, have access to more financial products and services, all of them delivered by providers regulated by the authorities. Let me comment on some examples first. Individuals can have access, can have facilities to manage their personal finance. Um, second, individuals can have all the accounts in one space. Third, uh, open banking technology provides tools to manage accounts, manage cash flows, improve credit and loan conditions. Moreover, open banking allows providers previously authorized by customers to access the technological infrastructure needed to initiate payments on their own behalf. And to achieve these objectives, the law requires that credit institutions, the traditional institutions, have certain information available to open banking service providers in a standardized, simple and secure manner. So the, op the, the open banking ecosystems refers to all the elements that facilitate the operation of open banking. This include applications, what we call APIs, standards, governance systems, processes, security, procedures to support all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> about the actors, the payment institutions. Um, the PSDI in 2007 established a new category of payment service providers, the so-called payment institutions other than banks. And the PSD2 in 2015 introduces two new players into the financial landscape, mainly in both cases aimed at competing in the space between bank and their consumers. So on the one hand, we have the account information service providers, 
so-called AISPs, characterized by having access to the information of bank customer accounts. These, services provide, these service providers can analyze user spending behavior or combine in one report all the information about the accounts of different banks of a single user. And on the other hand, we have the so-called PISPs, Payment Initiation Service Providers, which are, the, which are the service providers that initiate payments on behalf of the users. For example, bill payments or uh, P2P transfers, all of them are, are services executable by PISPs. So, let me ask how to frame the actors. Well, the broadest category for framing the above actors is that of payment service provider, PSP. This category is set out in Article 1 of both directives, uh, first and second. And broadly speaking, what all they have in common is that all of them can provide payment services. And um, <clears throat> if, if we see closer to the Article 1, we can have um, or we can distinguish, distinguish become, uh, between the following traditional great institutions, we have electronic money institutions, we have also post office zero institutions, we have payment institutions, what we are interested in now, and also the ICB, national banks, local authorities, regional authorities, and member states. So, looking at the payment institution as a subgenera of payment service providers, payment institutions means a legal person that has been granted authorization to provide and execute payment services throughout the union. So we can have um, three species on this uh, category. The first one, is it called Account Servicing Payment Service Provider, the SPSP. What means a payment service provider providing and maintaining a payment account for a payment account for a payer. The second one is a payment initiation service provider, the PSPI. So the PISP. What means a payment service provider business, a provider pursuing business activities on payment initiation. And the third one is what is called the account information service provider, the AISP what means a payment service provider pursuing account information business activities. And um, we can uh, speak about another kind of group or, um, or category, which is it called the third party providers. The term TPP is not also defined in the PSD2 but it's generally deemed to include all payment service providers that are third parties. The first two parties would be the um, a ASP, a ASPSP and the, um, the payment service user to whom the account belong, um, to, to whom the, the account belongs. So between the account servicing payment service providers, which would be, for example, a traditional bank, and uh, the payment service user, which is the typical user of um, accounts. So now let me um, speak about the services, open banking services. We have to first ask what are payment services? Well, 
Um, there is um, a list of activities on on payment service, which means any business activity which is listed, for example, services enable, enabling cash to be placed on a payment account, services enabling cash withdrawals, um, execution payment transactions uh, with or, or without credit line. Um, another one is using of sorry, is issuing payment instrument instruments. And uh, another one is money remittances. And finally, there is there are uh, eight categories. Finally, we have the seventh, which is payment in initiation services. And the eighth, account information services, both uh, mainly categorized as open banking services. Well, in this list, which you can find in Annex 1, first it was in, in PSD1 and, and second in, and in, in, in 2015 in, in, in PSD2, the, the Annex, Annex 1, you, have, you can have these eight categories or eight species, um, which we are mostly interested in the seventh and the eighth, payment in, in initiation services and account information services um, but to understand better the to understand better the subject maybe we should consider the list or list uh, some 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 kind of exclusions to, to understand better the the category for example the ones which are not bank um, payment services are, for example, paper checks, paper-based vouchers, paper-based traveler checks, transactions carried out between payment service providers, um, some, some kind of cash withdrawal services, some transactions meant exclusively in cash directly from the payer to the payee and also professional physical transport of banknotes and coins. With these inclusions in the list and these exclusions, um, we can now understand better what are the open banking payment services. And as a redefinition, as we said in the introduction, the definition is of open banking is not found in the PSD in the PSDs. So the expression open banking is is used in the market and mainly in the implementation in the PSD2 in the British area. The concept brings together those payment services to allow a payment service provider to access to access uh, users' financial information in a secure way. Uh, beyond access to information by a third party, other than the accounts managing bank, open banking allows a third party to perform payment transactions through the user's bank account provided. Of course, it has the user's permission. To sum up, what has been said, open banking includes two typical services, the account information services, the AIS, and the payment initiation services. So, account information services means online service to provide consolidated information on one or more service providers or with more than one payment service provider. So, what, what the directive does is that establish a right, um, a right that guarantees the use of the service. Particularly says, member states shall ensure that the payment service user has the right to make use of services enabling access to account information. And uh, 
that right shall not apply where the payment account is not accessible online. And on the other hand, on, on the other hand, payment initiation services means a service to initiate payment order, payment order to the request of the payment service user with respect to a payment account held at another payment, payment service user. If you want a payment order, means an instruction by a payer or a payee to its payment service providers requesting the execution of a payment transaction. And a payment tra transaction means an act initiated by the payer or on its behalf or by the payee of placing, transferring, or withdrawing. Placing, transferring, or withdrawing funds. And finally, um, we can consider what we call the remote payment transaction, what means payment transaction initiated via internet or through a device that can be used for distance communication. Also, in this direction, the right is established, guaranteeing the use of the, of the service. And the directives explicitly says that member states shall ensure that a payer has the right to use of a payment initiation provider to obtain payment services. So, what's the legal regime of payment services? Generally speaking, the legal regime of payment services is oriented to three main issues. First of all, uh, rules are established concerning the transparency of conditions and information of payment services. Second, um, secondly, rules are established on the respective rights and obligation of the payment services users and payment service providers. And here we have um, maybe one of the issues that, that generated most debate in the marketplace is about customer authentication, particularly strong customer authentication. And finally, the third part of the regime is authorization and supervision. A regime of authorization and supervision of payment service providers is established. So the next, the next and final section is devoted to analyzing the issues that affect this subject. Because only those websites and applications that have been authorized by the national authority may use the open banking system. So, particularly about the prudential framework, um, let me just remind that the first prudential regime was established in 2007 when introducing a single list license for all providers of payment services which are not connected to taking deposits or issuing electronic money. To that end, the directive, PSD1, introduced, as we, as we said before, a new category of payment service providers, namely payment institutions by providing for the authorization subject to a set of a strict and comprehensive conditions. But uh, technology, technological developments have given rise to the emergence of a range of, of complementary services in present years, such as payment initiation services. And the particular thing is that uh, payment initiation services were currently not were, sorry, were not subject at that moment to Directive 1, so were not necessarily supervised by a competent authority. In that sense, uh, different legal issues, such as consumer protection, security, and liability as others like competition, data protection, and other regarding the protection of payment service user data were the reasons 
which make necessary to uh, issue a new a new directives. So let me divide the prudential regime in two parts. First, the general rule, the prudential regime for payment institutions in general, and, and let me comment on uh, something about almost um, everyone. First of all, the directive established the conditions for granting and maintaining authorization as a payment institution. And uh, in accordance with this principle, it has been it has been established that um, member states shall prohibit natural or legal persons that are neither payment service providers nor explicitly excluded from the scope of the, the, these directives. And uh, second, what about control of shareholdings? Well, it is established that any person, natural legal, uh, that has taken the decision to acquire or to further increase directly or indirectly a qualifying holding shall to inform the competent authorities that the payment institution is um, that uh, competent authorities of the pay, of that payment institutions in writing of their intentions in advance. Uh, as you know, the the percentage are twenty percent, thirty percent, fifty percent, and a qualifying holding as is established in an audit means an undertaking which represents ten percent or more of the capital, the voting rights, or um maybe uh, to exercise significant influence over the management third about the capital and on funds requirements you know there is a need for a sound regime of initial capital combined it on ongoing capital um due to the range of variety in the payment service area the directive uh, allow various methods combined with certain kinds of supervisory discretion. Um, the required prudential rules, rules, including the initial capital, should be appropriate to the risks, to the risk relating to the respective payment service provider. So, um, as is established in the directive, payment service providers that provide only payment initiation services should be considered to be of a medium risk. No initial capital is required for account information service providers. For example, the, the general rule is uh, for, 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 for um, for the providers is that its capital shot at, at no time to be less than 125 euros. Payment initiation providers, service providers in the middle, it established that its capital shot at no time be less than 50,000 euros. And for example, for monetary remittance providers, its capital shall at no time be less than 20,000 euros. Uh, related to safeguard requirements, let me divide in uh, providers in general, first of all, and open banking providers in general. Um, the member states or competent authorities shall require a payment institution which provide uh, payment services in general um, to uh, two rules. First of all, funds shall not be commit, commingled, mixed up at any time with the funds of any natural or legal person other than payment service users. And the second, 
is that funds shall be covered by an insurance policy or some other comparable warranties, warranty from an insurance company or credit institution which does not belong to the same group as the payment institution itself. And related to the safeguarding requirements on open banking providers, uh, payment initiation service providers and account information service providers, when exclusively providing those services, do not hold client funds. Accordingly, it would be disproportionate to impose on fund requirements on those new market players. Nevertheless, it is important to say that um, they have to meet their liabilities in relation to their, be able to meet their liabilities in relation to their activities. So in applying this principle, it has been established that for payment initiation service providers, member states shall require undertakings for apply, well, that apply for authorization to provide payment services. As a condition of their authorization, they have to hold a professional um, indemnity insurance. And for account information service providers, member states shall require undertakings that apply for registration to provide payment services are referred in the Annex 1. And um, let me explore a couple of things more. Payment institutions should be prohibited for accepting deposit from users and should be permitted to use funds received from users only for rendering payment services. And payment institutions shall not conduct the business of taking deposits or other repayable funds. Um, when engaging in the provision of one or more of the payment service covered in the directive, payment service providers should always hold payment accounts used exclusively for payment transactions. Um, finally, a couple of things more. The directive regulate the granting of credit by payment institutions, but, or, well, mainly granting credit lines and insurance and, and insurance of credit cards, but only where it is closely linked to payment services. Only if credit is granted in order to facilitate payment services and such credit is of a short term, short term nature, which uh, means granted for a period not exceeding 12 months, including on a revolving basis. And um, finally, governance. Um, for authorization as a payment institution, um, when the application uh, is submitted to the competent authority, the payment institution have to have a description of a governance arrangements, internal control mechanism, administrative risk manage, management and accounting procedures, which demonstrates that those governance arrangements are proportionate, appropriate, sound and adequate. The competent authority only shall grant the authorization if is considered to be sound and prudent management of the payment institutions. 
Finally, there are others. Um, prudential rules, but just I uh, say as a vertai, for example, accounting reporting obligations, supervising precautionary measures, just in some cases, a registration of the identity, and what about the whole person providing payment services, and also anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financial requirements. Let me finish about just two minutes or one minute uh, about the exemptions. First of all, um, in view of the specific nature of the activity performed and the risk connected to the provision of account service information services, it is appropriate. It is appropriate to provide a specific prudential regime. Um, for example, they have to have um, authorization. They have to have supervision, but not about capital. And they have to have other um, control and monitoring from the authorities. But they are exempt from the application of the general procedures and conditions. And finally, there is a general exemption for what is called limited way use of payment instruments. In that case, the member states may exempt or allow competent authorities to exempt the, the providers that comply with two conditions. The first one is that the monthly average of the preceding 12 months total value of payment transaction executed does not exceed a limit set by a state, but at any case amounts to not more than 3 million euros. This is the first condition. And the second condition uh, is that none of the natural person responsible for the management of or operating of business has been convicted of offenses relating to money laundering or terrorist financing or other financial crimes. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent, for your uh, interesting remarks. Uh, I want uh, to speak about a, a little question. Uh, I think the main problem of the open banking concerns uh, the antitrust law. Uh, I want to have your opinion. Uh, there are some scholars who go so far as uh, to say the payment uh, uh, accounts, those to which uh, TPP have a free access, became, a, uh, this is not my words, but uh, uh, one scholar, became a, a sort of essential facility, an infrastructure functional for the development of an open ecosystem for retail payments. This, uh, um, this uh, qu uh, question is, I disagree completely, uh, personally. Uh, I want to have your opinion if you have one. Well, as you know, as you all know, um, what now we call um, payment institutions and open banking is only the first step um, in what we are calling um, other open services. First, open financing, and second, open services in general. In particular, in Australia, the um, 
the regulator began to initiate a process to open all financial services but in the way that in a short time we could have open services like electricity telecommunications and other ones so we are in the beginning and um, maybe I, i'm not an expert on on antitrust law i i wouldn't say uh, anything for sure but what's interesting is that um, in financial services now or till now till very recently uh, even though we were speaking about um, competitive market the financial institutions they mostly they had um, a dominant and um, they were all a, a very close family and only very few participants and uh, with precisely this uh, improvements about the APIs the technology that facilitates that anyone can has access to the uh, information and that the traditional banks has the obligation and anyone has the right to share all the relevant information so in that sense we have an opportunity to open these services to the consumers and uh, um, began a new way to make business and protect consumers. Th thank you. Uh, so, uh, as said uh, once, uh, Steve Jobs, we need uh, a new definition of a bank. Uh, <laughs> yes, for example. <laughs> this is uh, important because <laughs> Uh, because the the banks uh, uh, have to support uh, to um, pay for the cost uh, of supervision this is a, a, a important question uh, in the in the field of, of antitrust uh, we we can uh, come back to this uh, question at the end of uh, our uh, afternoon uh, uh, I ask uh, uh, Marco Ventura uh, if uh, he, he agree uh, to have some discussion uh, uh, about the, the the first two speeches uh, in this moment. Great, as, as, as you like best. Perfect. I, I think it's better. Uh, I ask uh, if uh, anyone want to uh, have uh, an intervention or a question by the floor, from the floor. Hello, I may I ask uh, uh, with, with uh, the chat? Uh, okay, well, I, uh, I have uh, opened my microphone. Okay, I, uh, Alessandro. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question to if, if you if you want? Okay, thanks. May I ask something to Adoracion, please? Uh, a very interesting presentation of uh, the same boxes. She has uh, listed uh, uh, a number of pros and cons, uh, but uh, I, I would ask her in uh, in Adoracion, in your opinion, if you. We are called to balance uh, the pros and, and cons. Uh, uh, which would be the the outcome of this uh, of this balancing? <laughs> May, uh, are, have you have you have, I think you have you have thought of this? I would like. I, I'm curious to know uh, your opinion about. <laughs> the microphone. Hi. Uh, th thank you very much, Alessandro. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I am studying the subject. So my my view is uh, uh, I have a view, but I have to study more. But in my opinion, I think the uh, regulatory sandboxes could be uh, a good system. But uh, I, I disagree uh, with the European approach uh, of the uh, European Union, Union authorities because I think that that uh, giving place to so many regulatory sandboxes in Europe without any harmonization uh, is not good uh, for Europe. In some way, uh, Professor Santoro also uh, commented that many firms in Italy they prefer to go under un, under other jurisdictions, and for este, for Spain is the same. So uh, placing this only in a in a national level would be good for some states like like United Kingdom. Uh, but but so uh, briefly, I think the system could be good to enhance uh, financial innovations and to foster uh, better financial services. But maybe the approach uh, of Europe, the European Union, should be more ha more hard, not so light. Thank you. Thank you. Other other question intervention? Okay. If uh, there is more, uh, no, I might, Victoria. Uh, uh, I might have uh, uh, from my side a, um, uh, from, which is a very ignorant side, of course, a question for Vincent and the sandbox. Um, is uh, the uh, experiment with the financial innovation uh, unique as it comes to regulatory sandboxes or to what extent has the same uh, approach been used in other uh, regulatory sectors has it been used well, I, I was thinking you know my immediate reaction with some in the group who also work with me on legal issues related to religion or belief was wow we why why wouldn't we apply this methodology to areas of uh, social innovation and, and religion for instance so I, I was wondering to what extent is this uh, experiment unique to the financial sector and financial innovation in particular and if you are aware of other examples from other uh, uh, regulatory frameworks uh, well, uh, yes, uh, indeed, uh, the f this experiment, this system uh, related to the financial system uh, has uh, other uh, other connections or, or uh, precedents. For instance, uh, it's not so far uh, uh, from the. Uh, Ex experiments with medicines in the pharmaceutical and medicines uh, field, yes, there is also uh, this kind of uh, first experimental phase, yes. Uh, and also uh, it, it has been uh, applied to other fields like uh, technological uh, field, yes, in order to allow, allow uh, some regulated uh, activities or, or products related with uh, communications or so. So it's not, it is, um, it's an, an idea which is related with this precedence, uh, but I think, uh, I think uh, principles and uh, public goods involved involve, uh, are not the same. Yes, for instance, uh, the exper experiment uh, phases uh, related to medicines uh, is to, to protect uh, lives uh, to, uh, and, and public health. 
Uh, but here also this system of uh, sandbox regulatory, uh, many voices said that it's not so clear that uh, we are going to protect with this system consumers or uh, financial stability and it's, it's a rising moral system uh, which is very good for companies because it's not so expensive as the formal uh, supervisory uh, system that traditional banks have. Yes. So for the new companies, uh, it's very good because uh, they also can talk directly and easily with the authorities. Yes. And in a short way of time, they can be sure of uh, being in the market and uh, making money. So uh, there are some criticisms uh, uh, from this point of view. Yeah? So maybe uh, a stark common approach in Europe would be uh, better to protect uh, the good ideas which are behind uh, regulatory sandboxes, applying in the financial sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, other question? Uh, other yeah. intervention, please? Yeah, if I may jump in, may I? Please. Yeah, excuse me. I got some troubles with my connection, but I had a question. Uh, yeah, my name is Matteo Corsellini. I'm a PhD student at the University of Siena and a research at Bruno Kessler Foundation. And as Professor Marco Ventura, I'm really interested in this regulatory uh, sandbox scheme, uh, though I'm really ignorant on the issue. And my question is, if this could be really an opportunity to, to experiment some ethical financial products. I mean, I'm not an expert in this field, but have been reading that there's like a necessity to uh, an ethical shift in finance, also in order to align corporations to more ESG goals and to create sustainable development. So I'm wondering whether or not this could be a chance, an opportunity to apply and test some ethical finance. I, I don't know if this question makes sense. It's just some ideas that I've tried to gather together. Thank you. Mm, okay, Th thank you very much for your interesting question. In my personal opinion, that would be a very good opportunity to focus what are you saying in more uh, sustainable finance uh, an ethic uh, approach to finances but uh, uh, i think also that to do this no or to focus in this direction uh, we would need uh, um, a common approach in europe in the european union and we don't have also, uh, we, we have to point it out that uh, this new financial uh, world is very competitive uh, in, in the global uh, planet. So, uh, Europe is not leading, the, uh, is, is not leading uh, this field and uh, um, companies and uh, countries uh, in the in the east uh, in asia they are moving faster uh, so i think this can also be a point uh, for europe uh, uh, we are going not very fast uh, regulating at a, at a le a european level because um, also, uh, as the first experience was uh, United, in the United Kingdom, uh, so they, they are living in Europe. No, well, they are going to exit to the European Union, but uh, for the moment, uh, in the space in Europe, they are leading this uh, sandboxing regulating and they are attracting, I, I think, are the uh, United Kingdom and uh, Netherlands, they are attracting uh, really uh, new startups and, and important companies. Uh, okay, for the other countries, like, like for instance Spain, uh, if we don't follow this more, uh, this uh, liberal approach and we opt, as I would, I would like, for more ethical approach, 
uh, maybe companies uh, will not come to our jurisdiction. So it's a difficult, it's a, an interesting question, but difficult to uh, to implement in this moment for the uh, geopolitical and economic situation, I think. Right, thank you very much. May I see if I can uh, add uh, 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 another remarks? Uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, the questions are very different because uh, the regulation we are uh, speaking about is about the investment uh, uh, regulation. Therefore, if you collect uh, money for benefit scope, for benefit purpose, it is uh, out of this kind of regulation. And you can uh, um, do that uh, freely uh, or with other kind of rules that aren't rules of uh, uh, investment regulation. May I add some, something? Rodrigo Santoro. Yeah. May I add something? Um, I, I just wanted to say that, that the world is changing very much. And we have to be aware that lots of things are, are changing. And our financial system um, is um, put on a strain. Let me put some examples. Uh, if you consider, for example, PITM in India, you have 350 million users for a single uh, institution. 350 million users. And for example, in, uh, uh, in China, where you don't have a regulatory framework, you have, um, for example, I'm Financial, which is uh, from the group of um, Alipay, Alibaba Group. You have more than a billion people connected to these devices. And most of these services, as I just um, told before, related to Facebook, are for free. And uh, this is... Um, this is uh, some kind of um, revolution in the financial sector, which will change the way we interact between consumers and financial institutions. And let me put another example, which is the United States. In the United States, there is not a um, general framework. You uh, most mostly, you don't speak about open banking. You speak about new banks, challenge banks, non-bank financial financial companies, non-depository financial technology aggregators, etc. And uh, you have, for example, companies like mine with uh, two hundred uh, employees uh, managing more than uh, um, two million, more than sorry, twenty million users. So I think the first thing we, we, we should do, uh, probably in order to think about uh, ethical finance and uh, other interesting things, is that analyze what's happening now. And finally, if, for example, Facebook, with their own capacity, managing billions in plural of accounts, may have this kind of um, provide this kind of, of services, the landscape we know now with the concentration cartels and dominant position uh, institutions, as we know in Spain or in Italy, in France, in, in Germany, etc., probably in a short time will disappear. Thank you for your observation. Of course, uh, this is a, a a important, very important question. Uh, we have to answer the question, how much regulation uh, we, uh, we need and how, how much 
freedom, uh, it is a, uh, um, opportune to, to have. Uh, it's a question uh, very complex. Um, maybe uh, on the point of view of costs, the freedom is the, the best things. But uh, uh, I ask uh, what happened if uh, the, um, the income or the, the money uh, is uh, fail? Um, in Europe, if happen uh, 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 this, this kind of thing, we can have uh, the investor in the streets and protest with the government. I don't know if it's the same in India. Uh, maybe it's the same in the US. Uh, in fact, uh, the shadow banking uh, uh, before the, um, the crisis, uh, global crisis of, of 10 years uh, and more ago, uh, changed the, the framework uh, uh, to apply the shadow banking also two okay uh, other other question other intervention if not uh, we now can have a, a break 20 minute 20 minutes break see you uh, 20 minutes later bye, bye. see you see you bye